Uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to this first talk of the sessions of Rust Nation. I am really, really, really excited about this talk in particular. That's why I ran from the main stage just to host this talk. Stu is a long-standing member of the Rust London community. Uh, his company, Red Badger, have been responsible for slipping in Rust into Nando's. So if you've ever used the Nando's loyalty scheme, um, and their back end, right? Yeah, yeah. So their whole back end's like... The whole ordering system, yeah. All built in Rust Delivery, now. takeaway, all Right, that. so if yeah. you've been using Nando's um, loyalty system, it's all Rust in the back end, <laughs> and it's all thanks to Stu. So I'm really excited to be hosting uh, Stu here, who's going to be giving what I believe is a seminal talk uh, for the entire ecosystem. We're going to be hosting a special brunch, a post-conference brunch at Red Badger. So the Red Badger offices are just not far from here, and it's gonna be focused on Rust in Enterprise. So it's gonna be a, an exclusive event uh, where if you're actually doing stuff in production, in a large enterprise, it's gonna be great to have you in the room. Uh, we're gonna have Stu give a very special demo of what he's gonna talk about today. I don't wanna spoil it for anyone. <laughs> and we're also gonna have a very special fireside chat as well. So Jimmy from uh, Red Badger is going to be here. Please come and find Jimmy afterwards if you are um, coming from a medium to large enterprise and or you're doing stuff in production and you'll be given a special invite to the brunch tomorrow. So without further ado, I want to introduce Stuart Harris, uh, founder and chief scientist of Red Badger. Please give him a massive hand. <laughs> Um, thank you, Ernest, for picking us up to bit too much there. Um, I'm uh, really excited to be here and terrified in equal measure, um, as you can imagine. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to try, there's a lot to get through. It's really exciting content, hopefully. Hopefully you'll find it exciting. I do. Um, uh, but there's a lot to get through, and I'm, you know, I'm going to be speaking quite quickly. Might trip over myself a couple of times, but hey, we've got some live demos as well, which is great. Um, I, ch I wanted to change the title completely, but then I thought you might have think you were in the wrong room and go somewhere else. So um, it, I want to call the talk Headless Apps, really, and hopefully we'll see why during the course of the talk I want to call it that, because the rest of it's a bit boring, probably. Um, but the content of the talk is exactly the same, so let's, let's uh, dive in. What are we going to talk about today? Um, what we mean by headless apps, um, what does the landscape look like today for building uh, mobile apps and web apps, and especially ones that share code? How can we improve on this? And you know where that's going. Um, and I want to introduce a new open source library that we've been working on for the last four months that can help, um, might be able to help. But anyway. We'll come on to that. But first, I'll need to introduce myself. Um, I'm Stuart Harris, founder of Red Badger. Um, but first and foremost, I'm a software engineer and have been all my life. Uh, first job in 1988 as a computer operator doing COBOL, of all things. Uh, big CDC disk packs the size of a washing machine, 40 megabytes. You know, you know the story. Um, so been around the block. But since setting up Red Badger, we've had client after client after client come to us and say, what is this, how do we deal with this situation where we've got to write an app, app for iOS and we've got to write an app for Android and we've got to do a web thing and there must be something we can do. Um, and the story's not really ever been great, in my opinion. Um, but we'll see. What we said we were going to talk first about what are headless apps, so what are they? They're distinct from everything else because we share the behavior um, across platforms. So we encapsulate the behavior of the application in a shared core. And that core is pure. And by pure, I mean in pure in the functional sense. So you know, a fu pure function um, only takes parameters and a return value and nothing else. There are no side effects. So we push all the side effects to the edge, which is crucial um, for uh, testability, this clicker's not working, there we go. Um, we have a strict contract between the core and the shell. Um, back in the 90s when I you know, started my career, um, I 
often heard this saying, functional core imperative shell. And I mean, it seems to have gone, disappeared, but the concept has always been there, right? This is, um, this is a, an age old architectural pattern. Functional core by, and pure functional core, and imperative, the shell is the thing that does things. Like that's where all the side effects are. That goes out to your APIs or down to your database or whatever, uh, even out to the UI. I think a headless app acknowledges that platforms are best at user interface. <laughs> right, we, there's no point in reinventing that. Right? That's, user interface is a completely different um, set of problems, actually, to building an application, in my opinion. And there's lots of my opinions in, in this talk. <laughs> You'll have to just excuse me. But um, they, they are. I mean, why reinvent the wheel? Like, there's declarative UI frameworks for all these platforms now. We've got, you know, Re React started the whole thing in 2013. Um, and we were very early with React. We ran the React first React meetup in the UK. Um, ran it every month with Facebook for four years. Um, ran a conference in 2016, um, React, Lon React London conference. And we're all over React, right? I mean, that, that whole declarative concept was brilliant even though it wasn't thought so at the beginning. Um, and iOS has Swift UI, and Android has Jetpack Compose, and you know these are all very, very similar declarative UI frameworks. So like, why would you reinvent something else? So we're not going to do that, right? Um, and acknowledge that UI is a side effect. Users clicking on buttons, displaying stuff, it's a side effect. Push it to the edge. And this is all about testability. Um, it's literally all about testability and having a huge, high, really high confidence that your application works really well. So to do that, we use the ports and adapters pattern, um, often co also called hexagonal architecture, and related to clean architecture, the onion architecture, etc. So what's the motivation behind all of this? <laughs> OK, I talked a bit about React. React is JavaScript or TypeScript. I mean, that whole ecosystem, in my opinion, is a bit of a mess, right? It's layer on top of layer, each layer kind of like trying to make up for the inadequacies of the layer below. And it feels to me as though it's just really difficult to navigate. Um, and of course, it's built on top of Xander as well, because JavaScript's a toy language. But anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the and there isn't, well, I don't know of any implementation of ports and adapters in this space, and I think it's an important pattern. So um, the whole point of this is to shift left on app quality. As you know, a room full of Rust engineers, we know all about pulling those bugs from the future and having them now. Right? So we can't even get past the compiler for whole classes of bugs. And we want to do that same thing for applications. Why not? Like a whole application, we should have all the problems right at the beginning. We don't want a user down the line finding problems or having a bad experience with our application. And testing applications shouldn't be hard. <laughs> should be really, really easy. And we don't want to do the whole thing twice, for once for iOS and Android, and even again for the web. So that's why. So what are the options today? So you can build with platform native. And if you're going to do that, which is, and it's a great choice, by the way. All of these are great choices. There's nothing wrong with any of them. Um, you're going to use, probably, today, Swift and Swift UI on iOS, and you're probably going to use Kotlin and Jetpack Compose on Android. You're probably going to do something different for the web. Nothing is shared at all, but you've got all control you want, but you're going to have different teams doing different things. And there's not really much overlap, and you have to reinvent the wheel um, a few times. And React Native, we talked a little bit about React, but React Native, obviously, is React um, for native uh, platforms. It's a good UX. I mean, it's still using native controls underneath. Um, and they're laid out using JavaScript. And we've got shared, s or TypeScript, hopefully. Um, and we've got shared logic. Um, but you do need to dig in a little bit. Like some, some, sometimes, on any large scale React Native project, you can't avoid having iOS and Android engineers on the thing. And maintenance can be problematic, which is also a very opinionated statement. But I think. React, as good as it is, like in the early days, it was a very functional paradigm. React was a projection of the state onto the user interface. So the UI could be considered a projection of the state. That's very functional. That's very pure. You know, if, you've, if your state's this, your UI is that. If your state's this, your UI is that. 
And that's what made React so successful, that functional nature of it. But I think recently it's kind of got a bit, you know, components tend to be too big now, I think, you know, we've got hooks, maybe they're making API calls. Like, how do you test that without mocking and stubbing and setting up environments and you're gonna write outside in tests that are really brittle, take ages to run, fail halfway through and you don't know why, so you run them again and two hours later you still don't know whether it's um, a problem with your code or whether it's just a flaky test. We can't have that in software engineering. It's not good enough. Um, Flutter is another option, which is becoming very popular. This is full stack, right? So this is everything. Um, all the way from the top to the bottom, the UI controls are rewritten in Dart by Google. There's Cupertino flavor for iOS, Material UI for Android, to give it a little bit of a feel that it's kind of native, but it's not, right? So for applications that are, um, you want the same experience on both platforms, it's great. Like Spotify or whatever might, you know, might work really well with um, this kind of paradigm, but it doesn't give you the platform native user experience, that, you know, the idiomatic experience that people expect. And teams do Dart, whatever you think of Dart. Um, <laughs> Kotlin, Kotlin multiplayer, I'm not here to diss other languages, by the way. <laughs> Uh, Kotlin multi-platform mobile, I think, is a, is a massive step in the right direction. So this is al also platform native. So remember what I said earlier about leaving the U UI to the platform, right? So you you would write your views in um, in Swift UI or Jetpack Compose, and you share everything else basically. But yeah, and, but it's Kotlin, and Kotlin's fine, and you do like the whole thing in Kotlin. And so most you know anecdotally, teams that are doing KMM are. Kotlin engineers, and they do a bit of Swift. And it brings the, the two sides together a little bit, which is great. Um, you know, you don't need to know a huge amount of Swift to be able to lay out UI with Swift UI. I mean, it's just, and if, if, the, if you're a Kotlin engineer, this is a perfect solution. Um, and then you can go the hybrid route. So capacitor, ionic. I know that Tauri are here um, today, and they've got um, Tauri Mobile coming out, so that's one to watch. Um, I think. This is getting a lot, lot better. It used to be a rubbish solution. It's great now. I mean, you can build responsive performance apps where you've got, you can use any web stack you want and you can, um, you know, you can get a lot of sharing then between the three different platforms. So I put these on a slide and, you know, this is just me. <laughs> you know, it might not even be real, but this is just my experience. Um, and obviously, what was it? You can't be wrong with the lived experience or something. <laughs> so um, on the top, we've got, you know, do they use native UI or um, UI? Or, and so therefore, do they have a native idiomatic UX for that platform? Is there a web solution involved? What's the development effort, the testing effort, the maintenance effort, and actually the overall effort? And I've got some sort of like exploding heads with the testing, the testing um, scenario for the web-based stuff because I think it can get quite hairy. Uh, we'll come back to this slide in a second. So, um, so this is where we introduce Crux. So Crux we've been working on for about four, four months open source project. It's experimental and it's very early. And um, but it, but it, and there's nothing new in it actually. It just brings together some great architectural patterns um, and allows us to, and and it helps a bit with the, some of the scaffolding and some of the sort of like logistics of of, of running. Um, Rust on all three platforms, etc. Um, the ports and adapters pattern is actually quite important. We'll come back to that. So, what does Crux um, give us? It gives us plat platform native UX. The same, I mean, same as Kotlin multi-platform mobile. It doesn't has nothing to do with user user interface um, or UI, UI layout. The behavior is shared. We plug capabilities into Crux to give the core, the ability to perform side effects. So if you need to call an API, if you need to make an HTTP call, or if you need to know what the current time is, time is a side effect, right? Time moves on. You can't, if you write a test that's dependent on the time, it'll fail after the next second, yeah, or millisecond, or whatever. Teams do Rust, Whee! and a little bit of Swift and Kotlin and Tide is good, because um, you, know, you can't really avoid that for laying out the UI and actually handling the side effects. But you know, if you're a Rust engineer, th those things are easy, right? Um, so, what does 
this table look like with crux on the end? Well, obviously, I'm going to give it lots of big ticks and starry eyes and things, but certainly the testing um, story, which we'll have a look at in a second when we go into the live demo, is phenomenal, I think. Um, and this is what we're trying to do, is we're trying to get some code reuse and live, live in the ecosystem of each individual platform. Um, so you can actually use it with any, any uh, UI technology. This chart, I th there's a tension between like what's easy for the business, and that's all the ones that share code are on the right of that. You know, the more you can share, the, the easier it is for the business. And what's great for the customer, right? The, the great, great for the customer, in my opinion, is an idiomatic, well-performing, great user experience, um, exactly what the users of that platform, you know, iOS users are different animals to um, Android users. <laughs> and, you know, you expect different things, and you want, you want to be able to um, have that great user experience. So there's this tension, anyway, and I think we can move towards the top right-hand corner of this graph. So the ports and adapters pattern, um, Alistair Coburn, Coburn? I don't know. in 2005 wrote a post called Hexagonal Architecture in which he introduced the ports and adapters pattern. And he suggested that the intent of this pattern is to allow an application to equally be driven by users, programs, automated tests, or batch scripts, and to be developed and tested in isolation from its eventual runtime devices and databases. That, in my opinion, is spot on. That's exactly what Crux is. Um, he also said, oh, actually, before, let's just go back to that, that slide there. So th we've looked at this diagram again, and we'll look. It's th he describes a, dr a driving side and a driven side, right? The driving side is the user clicking on a, I don't know, doing something, right? Sending events through, through, adap through an adapter into a port, basically. And then the driven side, so out through a port, through an adapter, and it's the shell that adapts um, the, the core to whatever. Uh, platform specific stuff it needs to do and that that whole um, concept of ports and adapters is actually all the way through crux um, he also said in the same paper that the application can be deployed in headless mode <laughs> um, we actually thought of the he word headless before but that's good validation so only the api is available and other programs can make use of its functionality and you can see why this is going to be good for testing right um, so Crux supports any client, um, the five different ways of using Crux. So for iOS, um, you have a shared library that's um, com probably called libshared.a or something. It's statically linked into the binary that's shipped. Um, we use Unify BindGen to generate the bindings. Unify is a project from Mozilla, um, which is brilliant at creating bindings for l lots of different languages, especially Swift and uh, Kotlin. Um, for Android, it's exactly the same, except the library is a shared object library. It's dynamically linked in, and we use Java Native Access to get to it um, with the same bindings. Um, the web solution, um, WebAssembly, right? <laughs> I mean, every single browser supports WebAssembly. Rust has a love affair with WebAssembly, which is brilliant. So compiling to shared.wasm is just the same as anything else. We use Wasm BindGen to generate the bindings. And you can call into the core um, from any web uh, framework, JavaScript, TypeScript, whatever. And then there's two on the right here. So you can obviously also write web applications with you or Doxus or, or you know, there's a whole bunch of Rust UI frameworks, which is great. And in that case, you can just compile the cr create in with that. Um, and if you're building a CLI, just compile, you know, you're going to write that in Rust as well, why wouldn't you? Um, and you just compile the crate in there as well. So, um, wrapping actually, wrapping the core in a CLI is actually a really, really good way of testing it. I mean, you can imagine a banking app or whatever, and you've got a CLI that you can use <laughs> to do your outside in testing with, like, you know, d deposit into this account, whatever, and you're on the CLI. I mean, what a great testing experience, but you don't have to have any UI, you just want to test the outside in behavior of the core. The type generation is done with Serta Generate, and that type safety um, travels across the boundary. So it's like React Native, there's a bridge, and we serialize types across the boundary, and we've got serialization and deserialization on both sides um, with Serta Generate, which is great. So Crux is anything new, it just brings all these things together, um, together with the architectural pattern. So this is what it looks like um, diagrammatically. 
the five different types that we had on the previous page, so iOS static, Android dynamic, web, web assembly, and then the two libs um, where you've either got web assembly or native or whatever. Um, the bridge, unified bind gen or wasn't bind gen, we use BCS for serialization across um, uh, which Soda generates supports. We actually do do serialization on the right as well right now because that's the easiest way of getting types across. Um, but we could do a box dyne any or something and do a bit of type erasure over the bridge. But we'll see <laughs> we'll see where that goes. But at the moment, that's serialization as well. But it's you know it's pretty. I mean it does get in the way a little bit, but not too much. Um, so logically, this is what the architecture of Crux looks like. The green bit across the top is like the pure path, right? So this is, I click a button, I send an event into the core, it does something, it probably updates the model or whatever. Uh, um, we need to tell the UI to render, and when it is told to render, it calls the view function, which gets a, gets a view model that it's bound to, and that's like the flow, right? But rendering the UI is a side effect. So we use these capabilities, and a capability allows Crux to um, ask the shell to do something. So there's a capability, there's a built-in render capability. Um, so it says render, and when the UI sees render, it calls the view model. But there's also request response if you're going to be doing HTTP, and there's also request response, 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 response if you're doing streaming. Um, and that's it, basically. That is the pattern. But you can see the ports and adapters. The capabilities are effectively ports. They're the API for the core. So they're just a way for the core, and we'll see some in the code in a minute, a um, way that the, the core can make an HTTP request. Um, so capabilities. Fire and forget. There's um, a render capability built in. Request response. So there's an HTTP capability in crux underscore HTTP crate, which uh, we shamefully stole the surf API for this. So if, you, if you've used the surf HTTP client, it's exactly the same as that. Um, expect JSON says, um, I expect to receive some JSON back, and I want it deserializing into the type that this event requires on the end. And because of t Rust's wonderful type inference, that flows all the way back, that event set um, can be considered a callback. So when, when you've got your JSON and it's been deserialized, call me back and send this event back into the core. So that's, this is the capability. This is how the core interacts with the outside world. It looks synchronous, but under the covers there's some magic, so we'll talk about that in a bit. And there's streaming as well. So in the examples, there's um, a server sent events capability, which is pretty naive, but it works. Um, that has a get JSON, uh, which works in the same way as the one above, um, deserializes into that e into whatever that event expects, um, and and it does that every single time it receives a service end event. Um, so it like opens the connection, sits there waiting, and in in capabilities, in when you're writing capabilities, you can use async await, um, and it, uh, yeah, there's an executor under the covers that does all the queuing and stuff to send messages to the shell. It'll make more sense when we get to the code. So I said we had built-in capability. We've got one built-in capability render. The crux gate. So there's HTTP key value platform at time. I'd ignore the last three. They're, they're, there be they're just examples, really. But the time is important because you know these things are... If you want to get what the platform is, what platform am I running on? That's a side effect. Um, key value store, et cetera. And custom, custom uh, capabilities, you can write your own. They're really easy. There's some examples in the repo. Um, there's a server set of events one we've just been talking about. There's a delay example in the book. Oh, there's a book. We've written a book. Um, come on to that. Uh, we haven't finished writing the book. No one ever does finish um, writing a book. Timer um, and sub pub sub are in the notes example. Um, and also, you know, at some point, if we build a community, we'll get some community contributed ones. But the important thing is you can write your own, and they're very simple. So what does a Crux app look like? It's just a struct, a zero-size type with a default implementation because Crux core needs to be able to Im instantiate it for us. There's four. There are four um, associated types. The the event is an enum of all the different types of event that this app 
can respond to. Uh, the model is the internal da data state for the, for the app. The view model is the external state uh, or the, the view of that state for the UI. Capabilities is a struct that just gives the app a list of capabilities that it, it, it is able to use and it can't use anything else. Um, and there's an update function and a view function, and this is it, right? So the update function is called whenever the user clicks, well, any time an event is sent into the core. Um, and here, if that event is, uh, this is a simple counter example, right? If it's an increment, we increase the count on the model, and if it's a decrement, decrement, et cetera. And then when, once we've updated the model, we ask the capability, the render capability, to send, us, send a message to the shell to say render. And when the UI gets that message, it will call the view function, and it will get back to the view model, and it's just a noddy example. But that pattern you know, is the way you build a Crux app. Um, the testing is interesting. So what does a test look like? Well, we have an app tester that effectively instantiates our app for us. Um, and we create a model, which is you know, something simple. And when we send um, an event to the app, um, we get back this thing that we can then query to see what effects the app decided to send. So the, the business logic is going to say, I want to I know, make an HTTP call, so there will be an effect there. In our, in our previous example, we had a just a render, so we're expecting the model count to go up by one and, it, and to emit a, a render event. Um, so that, that is it. So the actual effect we, we got, what, we'd, what did we expect? Are they equal? And the actual view? that we got expected and all equal. So you can imagine these tests run really fast, and we'll have a look at that in a second. Ah, now, actually. Whew. Right, okay, we're going in. Um, and I have no idea whether this, any of this is gonna work. Well, actually, it's all gonna work, but it might be a bit painful in places. Okay, so um, this, should have set this up a bit better. This is um, in the crux, uh, Repo, there's some examples. This is the counter example. This counter example is different from the one I, on the slides just now in that it calls an API. And the API is just a simple web server that's hosted on fly.io. And it just keeps an in-memory count, and you can increment and decrement it, and that's it. There's also a server sent events endpoint on there, so it can stream updates back, um, which we'll look at. But So in here, we've got an Android app. Um, we've got an iOS app. We've got a CLI, which is interesting. That's the server that I talked about. The shared bit is where our business logic is, so that's the crux core. We've got a shared types, which is the types that just effectively create, has to be a separate crate because of the way macros work, but um, it effectively just takes, the t takes our types from shared and just like um, creates all the serialization for us and the foreign language um, types. Uh, and we've got two varieties of web app, a U1 and a using Next.js. Um, so JavaScript, TypeScript, actually. So let's have a look at the CLI first, right? Actually, no, let's go, let's look at the one of the web ones. So let's go into web U. And we can use trunk to build the application, serve it, and open it on port um, 3001. And there. So this is just a noddy app that calls that API. Um, I can increment and decrement um, using the Compass Wi-Fi. It's a bit of a delay there. We do an optimistic update, um, say it's pending, and then when we get the actual response back from the API, we display the date and time. So that's the app. Um, let's uh, look at the uh, Next.js app. So here I'm going to use pmpm dev to open up, uh, compile. So this is, this will also, all of these build the shared library, link it in, all that sort of stuff. Um, so on 3001, we should have, so if I duplicate this, oh, not close it, uh, duplicate, uh, and 3001, uh, what? <laughs> no, that's not right, is it? Have I got something else listening? Oh, there we go. Uh, demo gods, I guess. Um, okay, so this is the Next.js application, and this is the U1, right? And 
we've got the server sent events and they're both watching as well. So if I increment this, they both increment. Um, let's do the CLI next. So if I just do a cargo, I don't know, run, um, actually let's do the watch. So let's, this can increment and decrement, but that also has, that also watches the server sent events. Obviously it's the same core. So if I increment and decrement here, I should see those. Um, and last but not least, uh, uh, Android and iOS. Um, so this is the um, Android one, which will take a while. Um, and the iOS one, start that up as well. So it's exactly the same application, um, only the UI is different. If I increment um, this, they, sh they should all go up, and this one as well, etc. So that's like Noddy demo. Um, and it, it, it's really quite boring, but it's worth actually looking at the code, I think, if I can. Um, so, this is the counter. So, what does we looked at what an, what an app looked like in the slides, and this is very similar. That's too big. Is that, is that big enough? So, can you see it? Um, there's a get um, which uses HTTP capability, just like we saw, and it and the callback effectively is the set event. And that comes in down here. So I, uh, in here, so either sets um, okay, and we've got like a, um, a, a a response that we can take the body out of, um, and we can call the render, or as an error, and obviously you can do some error handling there. Um, or there's an increment event, and we set the uh, we set the optimistically we set the um, update the model, and obviously this is just very naive, you don't want to unset if something went wrong. Um, but here's where we do a post um, and then call the set when it's finished and here we do a post to the decrement um, and then here's the watch as well. So um, we just update the, UR the URL and use the server sent events capability to get JSON and then we call watch update which comes in here. So now we, we end up with the counter coming back in this event and this is how you build your apps, it's just messages right, coming to and from. Um, which makes it really easy to test. So actually, you can just write tests that are um, that are quite easy. We'll come we'll look at the tests in a bit more, bit more um, with the second example, which is um, what Victor's working on. Wherever he is, raise your hand, Victor. There he is. Um, so this is actually. Genius, I think, and brilliant. We wanted to build a more complicated um, example that had like a decent amount of logic inside. So notes is a collaborative text editing, a bit like Google Docs or whatever, um, that uses CRDTs, conflict-free replicated data types, um, to to make sure that the edits are in sync between two multiple different instances or users of of the application. So I'm actually going to make sure I've killed all the other things so I don't want to get uh, port clashes. Um, uh, so, uh, if we do, we move into the web application and what's this next JS? So we need a PMPM dev again. Um, and uh, port 3000, here we go. So this is the note application. And if I duplicate this, on oh, oh God, I can't use a mouse uh, like that. Um, so we've got um, collaborative editing, um, and I've made a mistake already. So let's go and edit, change that over here, um, and you know you can just it just works like any Google Doc stuff, right? The interesting thing is not the application per se, but uh, the code for it. So there's quite a lot going on here, right? Because this is so. This is our app no, called Note Note Editor. Incidentally, these are the capability structs. So we, we in here we're going to use the timer capability, a render capability, a pub sub capability, and a key value capability. Um, 
and we've got a derived macro that's going to derive all the effects um, uh, which carry the sort of payloads to the shell. Um, we've got a view model, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the interesting bit is uh, Im the implementation of the app trait, um, and it's exactly the same except that the uh, events go on forever. So we've got um, an insert event. What happens wh when you insert text, where you know, over a selection or a specific position? What happens when you replace? When you move the cursor? When you select? some text when you backspace or delete, um, and when you receive changes, edit. And th there's a timer that, that loads and ups, um, saves your document every, you know, periodically, or after, after a second of not writing or something. So that's just, you know, typical stuff. But the tests are great. So if I search for sync tests, um, no, sync, yeah, one-way sync, right. So this test is great. So. It's a collaborative text editor, so we want to be able to really test it with two instances of the application. I don't even know how you'd do this with outside in testing. Like, I don't know whether multiple instances in uh, iOS simulators, like, anyway, this is just two cores that we want to make sure work together. So we've called in the, we've got a little function to make those two things called Alice, they're called Alice and Bob. We insert some, Alice inserts some text and these are her edits. We send those edits to Bob, um, and then we check, call Alice's view and Bob's view and check that they are the same. That is the test, right? We've just tested um, that, that these two applications can do a one-way sync, and the two-way sync is very similar. We create Alice and Bob. We insert world into Alice, drain her edits, send those edits to Bob, um, and then Bob inserts some text, drain his edits, and send his edits to Alice, and then we make sure that we got hello world because uh, Bob inserted at the, at the beginning of the string and that the two um, are the same, et cetera. And we've got a whole load of tests in there to test. So we know, without building any UI at all, that the core works, that the behavior of the application is correct. And just to um, run those tests, because uh, this is brings me lots of delight. So. If I run the tests for um, this whole application, and there's quite a few of them, um, they run in 30 milliseconds, like the whole suite. And if I run it again, twi 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 22 milliseconds. Um, I mean, this is <laughs> clapping me, but it's people who wrote Cargo Next Text. They, next test, they should be because running all the tests in parallel. But we, we don't. We're not encumbered by side effects. We don't, have, we don't have to mock anything. We don't have to do UI automation like with Detox or Appium or Playwright or whatever. It's like, oh, get me out of that world. So um, this is. We, we just want to make sure that the the core of it is solid as a rock, and then we can use that core anywhere and we can have applications that we can have confidence in. Okay, uh, was there anything else in the demo space? I don't think there was, so let's just see if we can get back to our slides. Um, so, what is the crux of crux? You knew that was coming. Um, so I don't know, is it a framework, is it a library, is it a runtime? It kind of is a bit of a runtime because it's like hosting your application for you and managing the asynchronicity of sending messages to and from the shell. We didn't actually look at any shell code, but it's quite thin. I mean, it's just UI layout and a bit of client-side code for each capability that just effectively adapts in the ports and adapters pattern, adapts the capability that, we've, that the core uses to whatever platform um, idiomatic way of making HTTP calls is. So that, that's just a little translation. And you only write that once, and you can use it anywhere, right? So the key is um, the UI layout and the binding to the view. So we, we didn't look at that. But it's a lightweight. It is a runtime, I guess. Can't get away from it, I don't think, although I'd like to. Um, for headless, multi-platform, composable apps, we didn't mention that actually the apps are composable as well. So you can have a hierarchy of apps if you want. So if, you want, if you've got a bit of domain-related functionality that you want to put in an app, I mean, I, I wouldn't go as granular 
as you would with your UI components. So I don't, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping between UI components and, and apps. But you can go, um, I think the apps are domain separated. They think of them like microservices or something. I don't know. They're domain, um, and you can compose them as a hierarchy, or you can have two sitting side by side like we did with the Alice and Bob um, example just, just now with shared behavior. Um, for better testability, and that, for me, that's the killer. We've, oh, I don't, I'm not even gonna go down that. Like Jenkins and outside in tests and hours of flakiness and all. For higher code um, and behavior reuse, for better safety and security, and for more joy from better tools. Um, so what's next with Crux? Well, I mean, it's young. We need to, like, we haven't even announced it. Like, <laughs> you're the first people in the world to hear about it. Um, we will make a scene, probably. Um, don't know, we might get booed off like React did at the beginning. Um, but we want to build a community. Um, we want to build some big apps, because we want to know how it works in those scenarios. Um, we haven't done that yet. Um, it's all very experimental. We want to improve the ergonomics. There's still quite a lot of work we could do to make it better. Um, we've written some docs, we've written a book. Oh, the book, uh, I did mention the book. So um, it's just an MD book, but it's got like a notification, how to set up um, for all the different things. And there are some rough edges still, like it's a sharp edge. <laughs> um, so there's that, and then there's um, a development guide, like a walkthrough with explanations about how to build, how to build what the architecture is, how to write a capability, um, et cetera. So that's all there, um, and we've not we've not finished it yet. The bottom section, the bottom in internals, isn't done yet. Um, but there are some sharp edges that need need fixing. Um, we want to write a crux doctor, so you can just run that in your mono repo, or whatever, and it'll say you know if you've got problems and try and understand whether everything's set up correctly because there is a little bit of setup to do at the beginning. Um, when, you, when you're first creating your iOS app or your Android app. Um, but you only have to do it once, but you, you know, it, it, we've tried to make the documentation as good as possible, but it's still a little bit, you know, we can help with that. We want to evolve the capabilities um, and maybe even add some shell side code. So you remember I said there's this like, little thin adapter that runs in the shell that adapts from the capability to you know, fetch or whatever on the browser. Um, we, we, you know, we could, the Crux HTTP crate could contain like client-side you know, client code for all of those things. Um, and you tell us, like, what, like, let's build a community and work together to make it better if it's, if it's worth doing. I think it is. Um, so in summary, headless apps share behavior across platforms. That behavior can be easily and exhaustively tested. And that test feedback is very fast, allowing us to be more productive. Um, and overall, we can move more quickly. So that's it, really. Um, tomorrow. Um, that Ernest mentioned at the beginning. We're having this thing in our office, which is just around the corner on Old Street, um, having a little bit of a brunch and a chat about what, how we can get Rust I more into the enterprise. Like We've got quite a bit of experience with this. We did it at Nando's, as Ernest said, and a very so few other places, um, but it's not the easiest thing in the world. Um, so come along if you want, um, see Jimmy. And we'll also do a bigger deep dive into Crux as well, because I think that actually does answer quite a lot of enterprise-y kind of questions like, like wasting a lot of money writing tests, for instance. So big thanks to Victor and Graham, who are sitting here on the front row, uh, co-author. <laughs> co <laughs> Co-authors of uh, Crux, but obviously everybody can get involved, so please do submit PR. Um, and that's the GitHub, the book, and the event tomorrow. Uh, that's me, thank you very much. Any questions? Oh, loads of questions. Oh, God. <laughs> I hate this bit. But we've got the experts in the room, so we can, so we can, we'll be able to, between us, we'll be able to answer them. Uh, hi, I just wanted hi. to see some of the client side CLI code. You didn't show how that side of things looks like. How do you set up that side and communicate? Yes. So I'm interested in seeing some of that. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned CLI, but do you, do you just mean like shell side? Or so any. Right, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. So let's have a look at the CLI. So um, very quickly, uh, the, 
counter CLI source main. So this is main dot. So this is, uh, let's make this big, get rid of that. Can you see this? Does that make sense? Can you see it kind of, a bit bigger? Uh, okay. uh, right, so uh, there's this, so this client side. We've got some commands, so it's a, a clap, basically a simple CLI. We've got some commands, get, increment, decrement, and watch. And we can we convert those commands into core into these messages that we send. But anyway, don't worry about all of that. It's actually a little bit. Uh, we've got a loop, and in the loop, um, so because it's a CLI, all the UI frameworks have these loops already, right? So um, you don't really have to create your own. But in a CLI, you kind of need a like an event loop, really, just to sort of sim um, so that's what that this is. And so this is in the loop, um, and. This is what I said, there's a bit of like serialization baggage that we have to, which we hopefully can get rid of. But we, these are the effects that come back from the core. So when we're asked to render, what do we do? Well, um, we call the view uh, function on the on shared, we, and that gives us some bytes and we serialize them, and that's our view, and then that's what we do with it. Normally on the, in a U application or whatever, we just update the view model and um, if it's an HTTP request, then we we have to. Uh, oh, that's the SSC one, is it? No. Okay, this is the SSC one. Yeah, the SSC one's a bit different because we have to sit and wait. Um, but yeah, effectively, I mean, this the CLI one is actually not the easiest of all of them because the the the, the web ones or the um, the you know the ones where you've got a UI framework are actually a lot simpler. Um, so, for instance, we've got uh, this is we have an update. U has an update um, function which U calls, and when U calls that, we actually then interact with the shell, and then we get this. And here, should we render? Yes. Do we need to make an HTTP request? This is with U, so we've got to go across the WASM bindgen to make the actual HTTP request, and it's a bit clunky this code, and that's the server sent events. I mean. It's, it's fairly minimal, um, and that's it. And then with this is the thin layer that I was talking about for HTTP, and for server set events, kind of just like maps the core. Anyway, the, all the examples are in there. Um, I don't know if that helps. It's a little bit a little bit clunky at the moment, but we can make it better. Hi, just a quick one. Um, I'm kind of intrigued by the idea of uh, hierarchies of apps. I wonder whether you got any quick examples of how that would be really useful? Um, of how it would be useful. So th there is an there's a really noddy example in the repo about where, where we've done this. We've got like a little uh, platform app that goes and gets the user platform. It's rubbish. But, but where it would be useful, I think, is when you've got a domain-specific thing. So, okay. so in the notes editing app that we, were, that we used earlier, there are some different concerns. Like there's loading and saving the document. And that could be an app in its own right because it's got timers involved. You know, you've, you've got um, delays and things after 20 milliseconds after you've stopped typing or whatever. You know, it saves the document. That's a se almost a separate concern. Nothing to do with the collaborative editing, right? So that could be an app on its own quite easily. Um, and the collaborative editing could be an app as well. And you could have a parent app that, like, you know, effectively channels the messages through to each of them. Um, so that. It's possible to do it at the moment, and but we don't really have any big examples where we've done that yet. But yeah, you know, I think watch the space. Yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. <laughs> uh, who's next? Um, hi, thank you for the presentation. Oh. Um, our capability is written natively, or as written in Rust. And what shall I do if I want something like SQLite, where I have transactions and complex schema? How do I abstract it? So the question. Was uh, is it, is it written in is it Prox written in Rust? The are the capabilities written in Rust? Yeah, they are. Yeah, um, I can show you what a simple capability looks like. They're they're, they're almost like the HTTP one is not a simple one. Actually, let, let's have a look at the service and events one that I was talking about because that is um, a bit more interesting potentially. Um, so there's a capability. We, we define some operations, 
which are the, effectively the request and the response. So an operation ties a request and response together. Um, this is um, our capability, server sent events, it's called. Um, and it has a context. Um, and when we create, when Crux, Crux Core needs to be able to create our capabilities for us, um, and it gives it the con uh, context to work with. And then this is the getJSON um, thing, which e effectively um, takes the response and deserializes it into uh, type T. Um, and we effectively spawn an async context. Um, so there's a, a futures executor in, the, in Crux Core which uh, gives us this async await, um, sorry, async await uh, context. So, so what this does is, is once we've spawned this thing, it just sits there. Um, we str this uh, stream from shell, so that sends the SSA SSE request, which currently only just has a URL in it, sends that to the shell. Um, and then we sit on that and wait and iterate over the stream, basically. And every time we get um, a chunk, we decode it and we update the app with that chunk. So this is an example of a um, one request, multiple responses, basically, um, until we're done. Um, but the fact that you can use async await in the context in the capabilities makes them really easy to write. Um, is there a better example of a simple capability? Let's have a look at the, the HTTP one's quite got quite a lot in it. Mm -hmm. I know this gets the time right from it. So this is like as naughty as you can get. Um, the capability is effectively that. So it provides an API for the core to use, which is just get. Um, and we spawn a context and we call request from shell, which is like request response. Um, and I wait that. And when we get the request back from the response, we just update the app with it. Couldn't get any simpler, right? Does that answer the question? Sorry, I got sidetracked. <laughs> Next. Uh, uh, yeah. um, apart from mm, keeping up with breaking changes in the current um, Crux library, is there anything else missing from using this in broad? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it works. I mean, <laughs> what, what, could, what could go wrong? Uh, Ship it. <laughs> I mean, you'd have to be fairly brave, I think. Um, but, you know, it's, we, we've come a long way in four months. Um, I think the API is settled now. Um, I don't think, I don't expect that. Uh, the, the, core, the bridge between the core and the shell is actually just only three things as a, like a, uh, process event, handle response, that's a response from a capability, and the view that the call, that to get the view more. That's it. So that API is not probably not going to change. Um, and so it's stable in that respect. But yeah, I mean, it's a moving target. So. Uh, we've got another question here. Hi. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, just sort of uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Just sort of conceptually, um, is Crooks sort I of. I can't see you. Oh, oh, yeah. hey. oh, sorry. Hey, yeah. uh, just conceptually, is Crux, um, like how it's made, is it sort of, do you generate this core binary with all these behaviors within, and is then that deployed alongside your apps and it's served with the website, et cetera? Or is it more like a API that then turns all of the UIs into like thin clients that just interact with it? Yeah, um, it's more the latter. So it, it, it's just a Rust library that's, that has multiple targets in it. So um, static library, dynamic library, um, WebAssembly, effectively, are the three targets. So we just compile it to. Um, so in the when you're setting up Xcode, for instance, there's some in the book. There's like a whole walkthrough about how to to do that so that it builds the shared app and, and links it in effectively. Um, and then you and then we just we use the generated code with the so to generate calls uh, and uh, and unify bind gen to generate the calls that we can call from Swift or whatever. So, I mean, that's, that's fairly straightforward. Once the setup is set up, there's a little bit of work at the moment. We're going to make that easier. But yeah, it's just a library that's just either compiled in uh, statically or dynamically, right, okay. or WebAssembly. That makes sense. Thank you. All right, so we've got one more question here, and then each of you will put one more question, and then that'll be it. You'll be able to come to the Russian Enterprise branch tomorrow, and you'll get a lot more exercise. Um, remember to speak to Jimmy about that. So we're going to take 
one more question, one more question and then I'll be here. Great, thanks. So how does it work for kind of experience logic? Imagine you have a list, and as the user scrolls, what you want is that the toolbar shrinks in size. So would you then basically, as you scroll, send events continuously back to Rust, and then at some point it will tell the, school bar, the, to, uh, the toolbar to, to shrink? Because then it seems like the event type would grow in a com with the complexity of the app a lot. Or would you suddenly have logic that is only in the view layer, but then it can't be tested? The one, and how it behaves if the user scrolls and stuff like that. There are lots of things that require um, shell kind of embedding experience, yeah. and they are kind of tricky to test them. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, so I think, I think um, is it, this is difficult because all the interaction with the shell is through the capabilities. The capabilities really, we want, uh, we actually want to do as much work in, in Rust as we possibly can, and as little work in the shell. So we want the, the shell layer to be as thin as possible. So we want, really want the, gen the capabilities to be fairly generic. So the HTTP capabilities are quite a good, good example of a very generic thing with a very thin layer. But if your capability was more specific or more domain aligned or whatever, you might have a fatter layer in the shell, which, um, which you can still use everywhere, right? So <laughs> you only have to, you don't have to test it, you know, you can test it once. Um, but yeah, you still, you'd still have to write that code in the shell and test it. Um, I think, we, I mean, we don't, we don't really know how it's gonna work in situations like that where you've got, you know, but I think it, I think it could easily work fine because um, it's async and await, and it's the shell's responsibility to make sure that you know that that translates well. So in the Kotlin examples, for instance, we use coroutines and stuff and suspend to to, to actually translate the, the messages we get back, and do the async stuff in the shell. And the threading matters as well. You know, like do we want you want to make sure that's all done on a background thread and not like on the UI thread and stuff. But you know, most it's going to shout at you anyway at these days if you if you try and do like work on the UI thread. So I think. I don't know, we're yet to find out. Build something and let's <laughs> see what happens, I think. Okay, one last question from um, Ethan's side. Ethan, you've got the hard task of taking the last question. Oh, last question, going once. Oh, over here, oh. over here then. Hello, thanks for your talk. Hello. Um, what are your thoughts, thoughts about uh, devising devices having different capabilities and how to deal with that. For example, if I have a pencil here on my iPad, um, another device maybe that doesn't have one. Like, how yeah. Have you thought about this yeah. problem? Yeah. So that, that is a great question. I'm really glad you asked it. Actually, um, so each each UI platform, effectively, if you want to call it that, is different, right? So they they will have different ways of doing things, and some things support some things, and some things don't support other things. So for instance, with the CLI, um, within the, there's a cat fax example that just fetches some pretty cat pictures, et cetera, but anyway, in the, in the repo. But that, that needs, for the CLI to work properly, it needs state, so it needs to be able to persist with like the key value store um, capability um, into a file on the thing. So when you, each time you run the CLI, you've got some state preserved somewhere. So that's, that's um, that's fine. I, and other apps, we, on mobile apps or web apps, we don't need that because um, you know we've just got, we've got APIs, we've got the browser, it's got state there, right? So we don't actually need to preserve it anywhere. So we just ignore those messages. But we are forced to to handle them. And the, the exhaustive pattern matching and the way that the types flow across the boundary means that if you change the behavior on the app, the shells will fail to compile. So Kotlin will say there's a missing. Um, when clause or whatever, and, then, and you know, Swift will say you haven't handled all these things, and uh, Rust, or, you know, any, whatever it is, they will, they will complain because we've added something to the core but not dealt with it in the shell. But it's quite fine to just ignore it. Like you, you, you pretend you're dealing with it, but you don't do anything um, if it's not, or you do the most appropriate thing for that particular platform. So it's it, you're forced. To deal with it, the compile it will com it will break over, the, which is a good thing, um, because you want you want when you change things, you want to be um, sure that everything can deal with it in some way, and even if that's ignoring it, that's fine. Great, thank you very much, Stu. Please give him a massive hand. Thank you.
So we're gonna do a room. We're gonna do a room check.